first time BBC television filmed the Shah was in 1948. The 27-year-old king was visiting a military base in southern England. The main object of his visit is to study our scientific and industrial technique, to see what contribution they can make to the life and well-being of his own people. The Shah had, since he was a young man, had had a fascination with things military. He wanted the very best, the most sophisticated equipment, and he was sure he could create a kind of modern force in Iran. He had no self-doubts about that enterprise. While the Shah smiled throughout his visit, he later told the BBC that he had been deeply angered by the behavior of the British towards his father, Reza Shah, and his country. In 1941, shortly after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, British and Russian forces entered Iran against only token resistance by the Iranian army, after warning Reza Shah about his links with the Germans. The old Shah abruptly abdicated and went into exile. His 21-year-old son was faced with the formidable task of taking over a country suffering from the shock and humiliation of a foreign invasion. What I approach eventually my father is not to have been mined the oil fields ah. and tell you that if you come, I'm going to blow up everything. But the worst was what happened next that the occupation of the country led to so many evil, fifth columns and the reapparition of the feudal chieftains, also a very reactionary power of the clergy or the, or the mullahs. The first real threat to the Shah's power came in the early 1950s. A new prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, had won huge public support by taking Iranian oil back into government ownership and ending the 40-year monopoly enjoyed by the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Mossadegh then set his sights on the Shah. He wanted to curb his power and turn him into a constitutional monarch, a titular head of state. In August 1953, the Shah left for a holiday in Italy, believing that Mossadegh was about to force him to abdicate. But Mossadegh had miscalculated. This was the 50s and the height of the Cold War. America, fearing that Mossadegh was too close or too tolerant of a small but burgeoning communist movement in Iran, had already decided to act. Three days after the Shah had left Iran, a military coup backed and orchestrated by the CIA removed Mossadegh from power. The Shah returned the following day. If we say that in 28 months and a few months later, Shah was in the middle of the war, that was, because the people thought that the threat of him was a threat to the threat of the threat of the communist party and the threat of the threat. ولی با سیاستهاش با مداخلاتش در امور روزانه کشور در خرابکاریش در کار دولت و این کاری بود که همیشه میکرد به سرعت این قبول عام از بین رفت اما کویتا یه تاثیر دیگری هم در داخل ایران داشت و اون عبارت از این بود که نظام پادشاهی رو آخرین رگه ها یا آخرین چیزهای مشروعیتش از بین برد برای اینکه در نظام پادشاهی ایران حتی در دوران های باستانی این رسم بود که هرگاه پادشاهی به دلیل مخالفت مردمش از کشورش فرار می کرد می رفت و بعد به کمک یک ارتش دیگری می آمد حکومت رو به دست می گرفت اون پادشاه دیگه مشروعیت نداشت برای اینکه دیگه از دست ملتش رفته دوره برگشته اونم با یک دولت کمک یک دولت اجنبی Back on the throne, the Shah consolidated his power. Parliament's wings were clipped, and he became, in effect, an absolute monarch. These were his army chiefs. It was these generals who backed him in his struggle against Mossadegh in 1953. Today, the Shah depends on the army above all for his personal security, the continued ability to do his job, and even perhaps to remain on his throne. Unlike his father, Reza, who started life as a Russian army corporal, the Shah is no soldier. His officers do a good bit of feuding among themselves, which has helped him to stop any one of them from gaining too much power. 
but he's careful to keep them happy by giving them lavish funds, mostly from American aid. The Shah returned to Britain in 1955. While he went shopping for military equipment, Queen Soraya, his then wife, was presented with the latest in British fashion. The Shah was now intent on turning Iran into a military superpower. In the 1950s, Iran's northern neighbor, the Soviet Union, was expanding its influence in the Middle East. Britain and the United States saw the Shah as a useful ally in their battle against Soviet expansion. Thousands of American military and civilian advisors started to work in Iran. With them came a large and steady flow of dollars. In the late 1950s, American military and economic aid amounted to 22% of the Iranian government's spending. Yet the Shah didn't rely on the Americans to protect Iran's borders from the Soviet Union. In a bold move, he struck a deal with the Russians. The Shah was affected by a diplomacy of the Shah, the Russian, who was able to do it and to give it to the Shah, that the Shah was in the center of the Shah, and in fact, as a part of the defense of America, that is, in fact, and in fact, even in fact, by this time, the Shah had divorced Queen Soraya, who had not managed to provide him with an heir. A few months later, he married Farah Diba, an architecture student. خیلی راحت منو گذاشتن میدونی یکی سی نبود که آدم مثلا وحشت کنه باش صحبت بکنه. از این طرفیم خود من یه آدمی بودم که نمیدم همون آدم این بودم که همیشه بودم و هستم حتی اتفاقا یادم میاد راجب این موضوع یه دفعه خب بعدها از چند سال از الازت پرسیدم که چطور شد چون من رو انتخاب کردی بعد گفت من از سادگیت خوشم آمد و این خب برای من خیلی باعث خوشحالی بود The Shah's eldest son was born a year after the wedding. The prince seemed a jolly baby, likely to make the most of the carefree years before he discovers, like his father, the other side of the coin of power in the Middle East. Your son, the crown prince, is now a year old. Do you anticipate his assuming a kind of monarchical tradition of your sort, or would he be a different kind of king? Well, I hope for himself that uh, the country, when he will assume power, will be in such a state of maturity that he will have a little less burden. But uh, a king in this country, I think that morally and uh, in question of prestige, will still keep a very dominant position. The Shah himself knows his own upper class only too well. As he arrived with Queen Farah Diba at the Marble Palace in Tehran for his birthday reception, the evening could have held few new faces. The ranks are pretty tight in the exclusive circle of families which rate invitations. The women are cosmopolitan and amusing. They enjoy gay life and resent the efforts of the Shah and his prime minister to limit their foreign expenditure. Their menfolk are mostly very rich and very self-seeking. They don't seem to care much about the Shah's plans. They bring to his court what seemed to me to be its air of somewhat self-conscious grandeur. Everyone seemed to be acting a part. The effect smacked more of a copy of 19th century European courts than of Iran's older traditions of royal life. Sometimes I think that if uh, anything happens to me, what will happen to the country? I remember my father one time one day told me that he was thinking of uh, creating such a machine that will automatically run the affairs of the country when he goes. I was hurt. I thought that maybe he did not trust in me. But when I assumed power, I saw how right he was. That's why my job and endeavor is also to create a machine 
that could run really the affairs of the country, at least the ordinary affairs of the country. He had already created his own intelligence agency. After the 1953 coup, the CIA helped him set up SAVAK, the Organization for National Intelligence and Security. To the Shah, the communists and supporters of Mossadegh were his only serious opposition. Savak ruthlessly suppressed them through torture and execution. Muhammad Ali Amoui was a member of Iran's Communist Party's military underground network. He was imprisoned after the 1953 coup and spent 24 years in prison. Aslan nemituram tozih bedam ke نوع دردش چیه من فقط اشاره میکنم این فوتبالیستا وقتی که توپ به بیزشون میخوره چه حالتی پیدا میکنن اصلا قابل مقایسه نیست با اون دردی که یه سفره چرمی هست بیزا رو میذارن و یواش یواش شروع میکنن به ماساژ دادن نمیتونه تداوم پیدا کنه بیهوش میشه آدم in the early 1960s, the Shah embarked on what he called his White Revolution, an ambitious series of reforms. They included dividing large parcels of land among the peasants and changing Iran's electoral system. The reforms were intended to transform Iran from a feudal society under the guidance of religious leaders into an industrialized country where the mosque had no say. In elaborate ceremonies, the Shah personally handed out the deeds to the farmers. But it was the electoral reforms that set the Shah on a collision course with the country's real power base. On the 9th of October, 1962, a high-ranking cleric sent a telegram to the Shah asking him to reverse the changes. In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful, your Imperial Majesty, after expressing my greetings and blessings, newspaper reports indicate that in the law regarding local elections for provinces and cities, the government has not indicated that voters and those elected should be Muslim. Also, it has given women the right to vote. This has caused great concern for the eminent scholars and other groups of Muslims. Please order the reversal of those laws which are against the holy official religion of the country. Ayatollah Ruhollah Musavi Khomeini was one of the most prominent seminary teachers in Iran's religious capital, Qom. It was an ominous sign. The clergy, for the most part, had stayed out of politics. The unspoken deal was that they would back the monarchy as long as the monarchy protected the religious establishment. Everyone tries his hardest to have audience of the Shah on this day at a ceremony called the Salam. Religious men from all over the country were the first to make their salams and the first to go home again. They're a powerful lot and can give the Shah valuable support. I remember every time that they went to the religious community, Mr. Ayun Akhunda, what kind of way they gave each other to make sure that they were in the religious community and with a lot of respect. و خود من هم که میرفتم تو این مراکز خیلی با احترام می اومدن برای که میدونستن که من در کارهای خیریه هستم یا یه تقاضایی داشتن یا مثلا برای مرمت فلان مسجد یا مرمت فلان مرکز مذهبی A year later on the 3rd of June 1963 Ayatollah Khomeini went much further It was the night of Ashura the anniversary of the death of Imam Hussein the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad Ayatollah Khomeini compared the Shah to Yazid, the 7th century caliph who had murdered Imam Hussein. Mr. Shah, I advise you, I'm telling you, Mr. Shah, that they are deceiving you. I really don't want people to be happy if they ask you to leave the country. Don't do whatever they ask you to do. Think for yourself. What is our relationship with Israel that the intelligence organization asks us not to talk about it? Is the Shah Israeli? This time, Ayatollah Khomeini was arrested by the Shah's police. The next day, thousands of his supporters took to the streets of Tehran and the religious capital, Qom. 
چه روحانیت چه ملت چه روشن فکرها چه دانشگاه ها همه نسبت به امام ترویج کرده بودند. اون ترویج از امام و اون هدایت های امام و اون فضیلتی که امام داشت سبب شد مردم خودسرانه بیان که بعضی از آقایونی که خیلی به مسائل نیستن گفتن حرکت کور بوده نه خیلی خیلی حرکت بینایی بود و همون حرکت بینایی منشأ بسیاری از آثار شد The Shah was taken aback by the number of non-clerics who joined Ayatollah Khomeini's movement. Among them were members of the Freedom Movement of Iran, a political party which was formed in the early 60s by the supporters of Mohammad Mossadegh. اون توده‌های مردمی که ما بهشون دسترسی نداریم از طریق این شبکه روحانیت که چندین هزار مسجد در تمام ایران 180 هزار روحانی در سر تا سر ایران به هر کور دهی که شما میرید یه مسجد یه حسینی است وجود دارن همه اینها توی حوزه های علمیه درس خوندن انسجام آموزش های عقیدتی دارن همه اینا خودش یک شبکه بزرگ یک ارتش ایدئولوژیک هستش بنابراین آقای خمینی وقتی وارد مبارزه سیاسی میشه ما استقبال میکردیم استقبال کردیم دلیلش هم این بود که خب ما به اون توده ها دسترسی نداشتیم The army responded with brute force. The tanks moved in and opened fire on the demonstrators. The Shah's government announced that 20 people were killed. Ayatollah Khomeini's followers estimated that hundreds had lost their lives. The true numbers will never be known. اون موقعی که این خب باعث نگرانی و تعجب شد که چطور مردم موقعی که یک برنامه های ریخته شده که به نفعشون به نفع کارگر و روستا و زن و گروه زحمتکش به قول چپی ها چطور ممکنه که تظاهرات و شرکت میکنن در این تظاهرات بعد که خب اونجا با کمک آقای علم که اون موقع نخست وزیر بود و واقعا مسئولیت یک نخست وزیر رو انجام داد که اینها رو خوابوند دیگه ما فکر کردیم تمام شده نه تنها فکر میکردیم سرکوب شده و تمام شده فکر کردیم شاه شکست ناپذیره ما همه رو از چه شاه میدید اصلا نمیدونستیم که بی علم But even then, the Shah still felt the need to keep the clergy sweet. Under pressure from the religious authorities, he released Ayatollah Khomeini in April 1964. Later that year, the Ayatollah released a statement. He condemned the growing number of American military advisors in Iran and a law which gave U.S. soldiers immunity from prosecution by local courts. According to this disgraceful law, if an American military advisor or even his servant harms a prominent Muslim scholar or an Iranian authority or citizen, the police cannot arrest him. But if the dog of an American is insulted, the police have to intervene and the dog's case has to be presented to the court. Ayatollah Khomeini was ordered out of the country by Prime Minister Hassan Ali Mansour in November 1964. He eventually settled in the bastion of Shia Islam, the city of Najaf in Iraq. Two months later, Mansour was assassinated by a supporter of the Ayatollah. The Shah immediately appointed Amir Abbas Hoveida, who remained Prime Minister for 13 years. I think the luck of this country is that he, it, he has such a Shah and that the Shah is dealing with the affairs. As a matter of fact, if you look at our history, you find out that any time we had a strong Shah, this country went in the peak of development. Any time we had a weak Shah, the country was uh, either occupied by you, Britishers, or by the Russian, I don't know by whom. Therefore, what is important is to have uh, a strong Shah who certainly could... Uh, bring behind him all the nation. During much of Hoveyda's premiership, the economy grew steadily and Iran enjoyed what looked like a period of stability. The Shah's powers reached unprecedented heights and he took to using the name enjoyed by the ancient Persian emperors, the Shadow of God. Outside Iran, he and Queen Farah became international celebrities. But the seeming calm came at a price. Iran was now a police state. Savak had agents everywhere, including a special unit for student activists. Michael Metrinko taught English at a university in Iran. Many of his students were arrested. 
The things they went to jail for seemed so minor. If they had been in America, nobody would have noticed anything. They were more of the genre of student activist and not student opposition. Just people who were interested in changing something. And in the United States at a college, in England at a college, they would have been on the student council. That's all. Trying to get the grading system changed or, you know, the cafeteria improved or something like that. In exile in Najaf, Ayatollah Khomeini had time to refine his vision of an ideal Islamic government. He called it Velayate Fari, a system, he wrote, in which a high-ranking Shia cleric would be the supreme leader of the country and have absolute control over the affairs of the nation. Dissent would not be allowed. Many devout young Iranian Muslims chose Ayatollah Khomeini as their marja, an object of emulation who could interpret the teachings of Islam for them. Abbas Abdi was among them. The man who called himself the shadow of God continued to underestimate the men of God in Iranian society. He had his own vision of the country he wanted Iran to be. We want to couple modern technology with the spirit of our old uh, civilization. We are 3,000 years old. In 1968, the Shah and his queen hosted a lavish arts festival in Shiraz. The aim was to put Iran on the map as a cultural crossing point between East and West. Avant-garde performances, including erotic and nude scenes, struck a sour note with many Iranians, and not just the devout. مثلا روابط ولنگاری و بیبندوباری حساس تر از مذهبی ها بودن و حتی برخورد هم میکردن به دلیل این که این, این فرهنگ و فقط فرهنگ خالص نمیدیدن یه وجه از سیاست هم برای اون قائل بودن سیاست های فرهنگی شاه رو فقط در حد همین قضیه فرهنگ نمیدیدن یه نوع سیاست ضد مذهبی و یه نوع سیاست ضد سیاسی شدن هم تصور داشتن There is a very specific and special relationship between me and my people. This maybe is not very well understood in other countries. And uh, as long as this special relationship exists between myself and my people, I don't see where somebody should uh, or could step in and, and break it. In 1971, the Shah treated his subjects to another spectacular, this time in Persepolis, to mark two and a half thousand years of the Persian Empire. Dozens of foreign dignitaries, including 30 heads of state, were invited to the party. They were housed in 50 air-conditioned tents with the menu provided by Shea Maxim in Paris. And 4,000 soldiers from the Iranian army reenacted the history of the kingdom. در جشن های 2500 ساله شاه دیگه رسیده بود به اون نهایت اون جنون عظمتی که نگالمانی هایی که خارجی ها ازش صحبت میکردن و داشت There was a serious side to the celebrations two and a half thousand schools were built around Iran but such acts were overshadowed by the party in Persepolis. As the Shah and his guests looked on the parade, Ayatollah Khomeini sent a message to his supporters. People should protest against this. 
They should ask, they should implore other nations not to take part in these nasty celebrations. These are dirty celebrations. Tell the Islamic nations not to take part in them. These are ceremonies that Israeli experts have created. Don't take part in them. Baba, بعد از 2500 سال ما یه دفعه یه جشن می‌گیریم. ببینید ممالک دیگه غربی 200 سالشون رو جشن می‌گیرن هر سال چه مهمونیایی میدن یا آمریکا هم 200 سال آزادیشو ایندیپندنس یا هر چیز جشن می‌گیره و بعد اون چیزای اساسی اون جشن‌ها رو در نظر نگرفتن متاسفانه. Uri Lubrani was the Israeli ambassador to Ethiopia before his posting in Iran. He saw parallels between the Shah and Emperor Haile Selassie, another autocratic, remote monarch. I felt when I came to Tehran, and, uh, and after a, a, a period of time, I felt that the Shah has lost his um, touch with the people, his contact with the people. He has become so arrogantly overconfident, believing that he had all the answers, that he knew what Iran needed and should not heed to what the people think or do. Lebrani had plenty of time to observe the Shah, meeting him on several occasions. The Shah was in awe of Israel's military prowess, particularly impressed by its swift victory during the Six-Day War in 1967. Uh, he really wanted to learn from Israel experience how, how Israel succeeded to do it, and he started to purchase every kind of aeroplane that only, pub, only appear in America, F-14, F-16, F-18 only they spoke about. Before they appear, he bought 200 to be ready with a strong air force to use Israeli systems as a superpower to smash all uh, possible enemies. The main enemies, as you know, used to be Iraq. The Shah felt that Persian Iran, like Israel, was constantly under threat from its Arab neighbors. An alliance with Israel seemed natural. In particular, the Shah was worried about the most powerful man in Iraq, Vice President Saddam Hussein. Saddam never concealed his dislike for the Shah and for Persians in general. He resurrected border disputes between Iran and Iraq and forced thousands of Iraqis of Iranian origin into exile in the 1970s. At the time, Saddam was also traveling around the world trying to acquire the most sophisticated military equipment, including nuclear technology. At the time, uh, uh, the Shah made it quite clear uh, that um, uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, I I Iran is threatened by uh, the Arab states, and in particular by Iraq, uh, made it uh, 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 of interest for Iran to establish a relationship with a country which is menaced by the same enemy. <laughs> Ironically, it was action by some of those same Arab nations that literally transformed Iran's fortunes. After the Seven-Day War in 1973, Arab oil-producing countries boycotted Israel's Western allies. The price of oil skyrocketed. Iranian oil revenues jumped from $4 billion in 1973 to almost $20 billion a year later. With the wealth came newfound respect from the Shah's Western allies. The special jet from London brought the Chancellor and Mr. Walker direct to St. Moritz. The two ministers have come here to Jet Set Switzerland to see the Shah of Persia about oil for Britain. With the wealth came newfound respect from the Shah's Western allies. The special jet from London brought the Chancellor and Mr. Walker direct to St. Moritz. The two ministers have come here to Jet Set Switzerland to see the Shah of Persia about oil for Britain. The Shah is here for a month and he consented to break his annual winter holiday to see them. Mr. Barber apparently batted first, having half an hour with the Shah, discussing mainly very long-range ideas. He wants to persuade the Shah to reinvest some of his enormous oil profits through the London money markets. We did cover the whole range of Anglo uh, Iranian relations and particularly uh, matters concerning economic relations. 
And what I think really did impress me was not only his grasp of the matters we were discussing, but also his very high regard for the United Kingdom. As the money rolled in, the Shah continued to pursue his lifelong ambition of turning Iran into a military superpower. This suited the United States. President Nixon had already adopted his Nixon doctrine of allowing other nations to assume greater responsibilities for their own defense. The security of the Persian Gulf was readily delegated to the Shah. What is your ambition to be the fourth largest military power in the world? Uh, probably the best, non-atomic. Today, Iran's armed forces possess simply the best military equipment in the world, no matter where it's made. This combined artillery battalion is made up both of 175mm guns from America and 130s from Russia, the ones the North Vietnamese use to such effect. It's a powerful combination. From where the Shah sat, Iran's impressive economic growth and political stability offered lessons for other countries. You will have to change because if you don't change, I don't know what is going to happen to you in the future. What do you think will happen? Go back to the caves. You think that's our fate? If it continues really in this way, it might take some time, but you are going to go down and down. You Be can't move up. Because of our lack of discipline, you think? Because of your lack of discipline, this is the best word that could be used. قدرت دفاعی برای ایران لازم بود ولی پنجمین ارتش جهان این یک پایه یک زیرساخت یک پی اقتصادی صنعتی و فرهنگی میخواد که ایران تا 20 سال بعدش هم نمیتونست پیدا بکنه اینها رو دیگه متوجه نشد شاه به اون موقع هیچ موضوعی در زندگیش نرفت نمیتوانست اصلا ذهنش توانایی رفتن به اون نداشت As commander in chief, why is it that you need a fighter bomber force of 300 planes? Why do you need 700 helicopters, 1,700 tanks? Where exactly is the threat that demands a, a war machine of this size? Well, I have been asked about uh, the same question in two or three places. My uh, invariable answer from now on will be, uh, it's as if you ask the same question to the British or the French. We are assuming such a position and even eventually more even than you in Europe because of the vacuum that there is around us. There is nothing. The immediate threat was still Iraq. Although Iran and Iraq signed an accord respecting each other's borders in 1975, the Shah never believed Saddam would honor it. He spoke frankly to the Israeli ambassador. He, he laughed. He said, this agreement I was referring to is not worth the paper it was signed on. And uh, uh, he felt, the Shah at the time felt, that the, he has no doubt that when the time came, Iran was go is going to be attacked by Iraq. And I have to have a strong and modern army. While the Shah focused on his foreign enemies, Savak, his intelligence agency, was losing sight of the real threat closer to home. The oil wealth had mainly benefited a small group close to the Shah. The gap between rich and poor was becoming a gulf. In Najaf, Ayatollah Khomeini sharpened his pen. The Shah has been talking about progress for more than 10 years. But the majority of people are engulfed in poverty and misery. He has beautified Tehran on the surface and has built multi-story buildings for himself and his cronies.
but in villages where the majority of people live, they don't even have the most basic standard of living. Foreign intelligence organizations were seemingly oblivious to the grievances building up within Iran. The CIA was much more interested in what was going on in its northern neighbor, the Soviet Union. The reading from Washington was that the Shah was completely in control, that there was no great threat to his rule, and we didn't have to pay much attention to that. And that's, I realize for Iranians, this is impossible to believe. I mean, that the Americans were not worried about all of the little things that were going on inside Iran. For the most part, we really were not interested at all. Iran was a base from which we could watch a lot of other things going on, but it was not a, we were not particularly interested in the domestic operations in Iran itself. The world was, though, keenly interested in the price of oil. The Shah resisted all efforts to get him to bring down the price. Instead, he urged the West to cut back on its consumption, a message well ahead of its time. Since we have a very nasty climate, why do you say that we should uh, suffer this kind of discomfort and this kind of... Uh... Well, you call that discomfort, but do you know that you can get 70,000 derivatives from oil? Is it right to waste it? What couldn't we do with uh, those 70,000 derivatives? Your fathers and forefathers lived and probably they were as strong as you are and their houses were either heated with coal or not heated at all but in any way you are just wasting this precious stuff the dollar in particular was hit hard by the high price of oil yet the Shah continued to enjoy Nixon's support the American government tried to get him to moderate the price of oil following the big uh, increase in 1973 mm -hmm. and it um, we never we never succeeded in, in gaining any moderation on that score at all then in 1975 the tide began to turn my name is jimmy carter and i'm running for president Presidential candidate Jimmy Carter criticized the Nixon administration for ignoring human rights abuses and selling weapons to dictatorships. Iran was one of those he singled out. Iran is going to get 80 F-14s before we even meet our own Air Force orders for F-14s. And the shipment of Spruance class destroyers to Iran are much more highly sophisticated than the Spruance class destroyers that are presently being delivered to our own Navy. This is ridiculous, and it ought to be changed. After he became president, he realized fairly quickly that the United States relied on the Shah, that we had tremendous political, military, and economic relations with Iran. What it did do, however, is that it opened up a lot of expression in Iran. Because for the first time, uh, Iranian dissidents, people who were opposed to the Shah, thought that they had an ally in Washington, and they were speaking far more freely. In 1976, the CIA released a psychological profile of the Shah in which he was described as a brilliant but dangerous megalomaniac who was likely to pursue his own aims in disregard to the interests of the United States. Zihn. یت ما درست یا غلط این بود که آمریکا هم یه شاهه یعنی اون به واسطه این حمایت که این قدرت از خودش نشون میده حالا شما ببینید یه رئیس جمهوری اومده که اولین شعارش علی یا حالا یه شعار مهم میشه جوریه که میشه علیه این رژیم اونو تفسیر کرد اصلا خود این روحیه بخش میشه که آقا پشت طرف داره چی میشه خالی میشه Accepting the new reality, the Shah's government gave in to American demands for more freedom of expression and respect for human rights. But democracy was still a step too far. Do you foresee a time when, uh, you, the, when Iran might return to a multi-party system? Uh, is this a temporary measure to meet 
uh, a crisis or do you uh, think this is the be kind of uh, political system best suited to your country more or less permanently? All will depend on the will of the people finally because uh, I'm not eternal and there will be the after me time but I think that we have just taken what is good for this country and uh, I even sometimes wonder if this multi-party system is good for those who have it elsewhere. After nearly 13 years, the Shah replaced his Prime Minister, Hoveida, with Jamshid Amuzigar. Then, when Iran's Arab neighbors lifted the oil boycott, the price of oil fell and the bonanza was over. The Shah continued to expand the army, but most of his ambitious industrial and economic projects were stalled. This came to a, a bad moment when oil prices leveled off in 75 and the boom that uh, they had uh, created in Iran began to stagnate or subside. A lot of people who had been called in from the village to, to work on construction projects were left without work and I think it provided a kind of tinder for the revolution that was to come. On the 31st of December 1977, Jimmy Carter and his wife celebrated the new year in Iran. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. This is a great tribute to you, Your Majesty, and to your leadership and to the respect and the admiration and love which your people give to you. I watched President Carter on TV toasting the Shah on New Year's Eve and thought it was one of the silliest things I had ever seen. Especially when the Shah lifted his champagne glass and I thought, we're in a Muslim country. He's celebrating an American holiday by toasting with alcohol. Isn't this dumb? Doesn't he know anything about his own country or the people in his own country? Within a week of President Carter's visit, the Shah made what may have been the biggest mistake of his reign. Ayatollah Khomeini's son had died in mysterious circumstances in Najaf two months earlier. The word on the street was that Savak, acting on the Shah's orders, had killed him. Hoveida, the former prime minister, was given the task of planting an article in the press rebutting the claims. It was the first mention of Ayatollah Khomeini's name in a national newspaper since his expulsion in 1964. The article accused Ayatollah Khomeini of being an anti-revolutionary agent of the British. It had an incendiary effect. Thousands of protesters poured onto the streets. It wasn't just Tehran. Chanting crowds emerged in several cities. The name on their tongues? Khomeini. I think most older Iranians knew his name. But a lot of younger ones had not heard it because I asked younger people and they literally did not know. And later on, as the revolution became hotter and hotter and more and more people were getting involved in it, I would ask them when they had first heard the name Khomeini and they would admit that I just heard it this year, a couple of months ago. The army brought the protests to a swift end by opening fire on the demonstrators. But although the Shah still didn't know it, a 77-year-old exiled cleric now posed a real threat to his regime. In part two, in two weeks' time, the Shah's final tumultuous year and the triumphant return of an Ayatollah. By the 70s, the Shah of Iran had become, to many of his subjects, a remote, autocratic figure living in unimaginable luxury. His parliament was now a mere rubber stamper of his commands. He had total control.
الان آدم فکر میکنه که اون موقعی که فضای باز سیاسی به وجود آمد متاسفانه بد موقعی بود یعنی, یعنی تلویحا قبول کرده بودن که خودشون خلاف قانون اساسی عمل میکنه ولی به خاطر مخت... موقعیت استراری که ایران داشت بله به دلیل خب گروه هایی که میخواستن اصلا تیشه به رژیم سیستم بزنن و خب ایشون معتقد بود که پادشاهی یه چیزی که برای ایران خوبه برای یک پارچه یه ایران و یه سمبل بالای همه احزاب Do you think that the absolute uh, power which you hold in your country might be dangerous in someone else's hands? Uh, not if they keep the present institutions that I have set up because personally I have three or four channels of inspection and learning the truth if what I have today at my disposal is kept intact they will be provided with all the instruments of checking and controlling but these channels all come back to you they come back to me yes as they should so it isn't an exaggeration in fact to say that you have absolute power inside Iran Uh, I have absolute power, maybe, because uh, things have turned this way. In January 1978, the Shah made what was probably the biggest mistake of his reign. On his orders, a newspaper article was published. It triggered an extraordinary response with protests erupting in several cities in Iran. Thousands of people poured onto the streets, chanting the name of a 77-year-old cleric who'd been living in exile for almost 15 years. The first time I actually heard the name of Imam Khomeini was on the streets of Tabriz. I want to say it was February of the year 1978, when I heard his name being shouted, Long live Khomeini. I asked who it was. I was told. Told something about his background. I think most older Iranians knew his name. But a lot of younger ones had not heard it because I asked younger people and they literally did not know. And later on, as the revolution became hotter and hotter and more and more people were getting involved in it, I would ask them when they had first heard the name Khomeini and they would admit that I just heard it this year, a couple of months ago. The article planted by the Shah's secret police, Savak, accused Ayatollah Khomeini of being a British agent. The charge backfired and turned a respected but relatively obscure cleric into a figurehead for all those who opposed the Shah. Mr. Khomeini was a strategist of Pinazir. If someone came to him and talked to him, he was 90% of him. He was 10% of him. He said, you are from us. This is very important. In the face of those people, if you are with him, you are 95% of him. در پنج درصد مخالفیت شما رو ترد میکنن مثل خیلی از گروه های سیاسی که هم نکنون هم هستن خب آهای خمینی اینجوری نبود Ayatollah Khomeini had been living in the Iraqi town of Najaf since the Shah had expelled him His sermons were smuggled back into Iran on cassette tapes and a small but dedicated band of supporters would do their best to spread his words to the mosques his office in the Iranian city of Qom was kept under close watch by Savak throughout his years in exile, but it was never closed down. ارتباط با امام به وسیله نامه به وسیله افرادی که می رفتند و می آمدن و اینکه بیت امام را سر پا نگه داریم یکی از وظایف انقلابیون و کسانی که در نهزت بودن چون رفتن منزل امام خیلی ساده نبود معمولا مشکل می تراشیدن افراد رو می گرفتن بازداش می کردن اما بنابر این بود به هر قیمتی شده بیت رو زنده نگه دارن و لذا روحانیون می آمدن می رفتن بحث های مذهبی می کردن بحث های دینی می کردن چون بنا نبود اونجا بحث های سیاسی بشه و مرحوم عجد الاسلام و المسلمین آقای احمد آقا رزوان الله تعالی علیه یا آیت الله احمد آقا بگیم اون هم در کنار این آقایون هدایت می کرد ارتباط مستقیم با امام داشت تا به نتیجه رسید. Just why the normally ruthless Savak allowed the Ayatollah's network to operate under their nose is not clear. 
the Shah's secret police had already successfully contained an underground network of guerrilla movements. Other opponents of his regime, including communist and nationalist activists, were arrested, tortured, and sometimes executed. But in a deeply religious country like Iran, it appears Savak felt it had to tread carefully. اون موقع محلات تهران هر کدوم یه جلسات خاص خودشون هم داشتن که حتی علنی هم بود یعنی حکومت هم کارش نمیتونست بکنه اما خدامون میدونستیم که باید به این جلسات بریم در قوم وقتی شما میرفتید وقتی در عمق بازار قوم میرفتید میخواستید تصویب بخرید این در رو که میبست پشت در یعنی نه رو به خیابون پشت در عکس بزرگ آیتال خمینی بود بنابراین این ظاهر شده بود انگار که یه قطره ای میخواست که این قطره این سطل رو پر کنه یا بریزه یا, یا حالت عمومی بهش بده به تعبیر خود آقای خمینی که به دفعات گفته بود اینو به این عموم ما شنیدیم این که میگفتش که میوه برسه بیا تو خیابون ایشون به معمولا به گروه های چریکی اینا میگفت خودتون رو به کشتن ندیم وقتی وقت شد میگم The publication of the anti-Khomeini article provided that moment. The army was called in to crush the protests. Dozens were killed. Forty days later, even bigger crowds came onto the street to demonstrate against the killings and declare their support for the Ayatollah. Stunned by the scale of the protest, the Shah refused to believe that Ayatollah Khomeini alone could prompt such a response. He suspected the hand of foreign governments and in conversation with U.S. diplomats, directly accused America of supporting his opponents. And he came up with two theories. One was the Americans wanted to, again, as in earlier in the 20th century, wanted to divide Iran into spheres of influence with the Russians taking the north and the Americans taking the south with the oil. And that was one theory. The other theory that uh, operated in his mind was that the Americans were not sure that he would stand up to Soviet power the way uh, that they would like. And they thought that maybe a religious-led government would be more adamantly anti-communist than he was, and therefore they planned to get rid of him. It was this, my reaction was, what kind of a nut is it that we are depending on to uh, preserve our interests in this very important country. Amid the turmoil, the Shah's inner circle noticed changes in his behavior and appearance. He was losing weight and his actions were becoming more erratic. The Shah had been diagnosed with lymphatic cancer in 1974, but he chose not to tell those closest to him. Another crisis, another prime minister. This time the Shah appointed a military man, General Azhari, and tasked him with bringing back law and order. Martial law and a new military government are no long-term solutions to Iran's political problems, simply a short-term response to the violence of the past few days. The fact is, the Shah has failed to make civilian government work because he wasn't prepared to let his governments go as far as their opponents wanted them to. Now, a new military government will no doubt jam the lid hard down on political life once again. But until a proper solution is found here, there can be no satisfactory form of government for Iran. But while the new military government was meant as a demonstration of strength, the embattled Shah was simultaneously offering concessions. Among the gestures was a mass release of political prisoners. در یک شب مامورین اومدن اعلام کردند که لیست آوردن که فلانی و فلانی و فلانی آماده بشن لباسشون بپوشن آزادن برن که اون لیست شامل هزار نفر میشد. اولین زندانیان سری زندانیان سیاسی که آزاد شدن حدود هزار نفر بودن روز چهار آبان بود. که منم جز اونها بودم دیگه از زندان آزاد شدیم و از فردا شدیم و خیابون ها چقدر شلوغ مردم در ازدهام و تظاهرات هست و خلاصه ما هم دیگه شروع کردیم به شرکت در تظاهرات در کنار مردم 
In a further sop to the crowds, the Shah ordered the arrest of a number of his former ministers. But far from appeasing his opponents, the move was interpreted as a clear sign of his weakness. The Shah's allies simply felt betrayed. Dariush Homayun was one of those arrested and imprisoned. Amir Abbas Hoveda, who served the Shah for 13 years as Prime Minister, was also arrested. بعد خیلی ناراحت بودن البته آدم با با گذشت زمان میبینه که چقدر کار اشتباهی بود و باعث تاسف و همیشون هم یه دست وزرایی که گرفتن بر سر متاسفانه اون اون موقع انقدر شرایط شلوغ و قاطی و عقاید مختلف می اومد و میرفت که خب یه تصمیماتی گرفته میشد که بعد آدم میبینه که تصمیمات درستی نبود ولی خب این موقعی که آدم به عقب نگاه میکنه But despite the new military government, the anticipated crackdown on the demonstrations didn't materialize. The Shah no longer appeared to have the stomach for a fight. If the Shah really wanted to take the people's actions and take the people's actions, they don't want to take the people's actions and take the people's actions. The people's actions زمانی شروع شد که اطمینان پیدا کردن که کشت و کشتاری در بین نیست سربازها رفتن تو سربازخونه ها تو پادگان ها و کاملا در امنیت هستن By December when millions of devout Iranians turned out for the annual Ashura the anniversary of the death of Imam Hussein the event turned into a pro Khomeini demonstration of epic proportion This then is what the military government claims to be the minority voice of dissent in Iran today. This no doubt is what they'll later claim also to be a purely religious demonstration. But there's no mistaking what this in fact really is. It's a massive voice of protest against the rule of the Shah. وقتی که فیلم ویدیوی تظاهرات عاشورا تاسو آمد آقای خمینی برای اولین بار این رو به طور عینی لمس کرد که چه جایگاهی در انقلاب داره و جامعه داره کجا میره نه تنها ایشون خوب برای خود ما هم خیلی جالب بود دیگه تا اون زمان ما چنین چیزهایی رو ندیده بودیم کانتر دمنستریشنز این فیور اف دی شا ارگنایزد بای ساواک فلت لس دن کنوینسینگ کارز ویچ دید نات شو ا رویال پورتریت had their windscreen smashed by either the troops, the police, or the demonstrators. Plainclothes agents who readily identify themselves made no secret of their role as crowd rousers. As with the cars, any shops not displaying loyal pictures were set upon by the demonstrators. Youths wielding sticks and stones, running down the streets, breaking windows, and breaking heads when the mood took them. In contrast to the previous year when they'd hosted a banquet for President Carter, the Shah and his wife celebrated the new year of 1979 quietly. <laughs> و در اول که آدم فکر نمی کرد این تظاهرات یه چیزی که میخواد تمام اساس مملکت رو به هم بزنه و اکسال عمل دولت هم اونجوری که باید درست نبود یا سعی میکردن در اون موقع یه کارایی بکنن که نتیجه نداد دیگه اواخر بود دیگه بعد از بعد از ازهاری فکر میکنم که یادم تیمسار اوویسی و تیمسار مقدم آمدن پیش من گفتن اگه تا دو سر روز دیگه علازت یه نخواست فضیر رو انتخاب نکنن ممکنه اصلا مردم از جنب شهر بیان 
به کاخ حمله کنند In a final bid to save his throne, the Shah asked an opposition member, Shahpur Bakhtiar, to become the new prime minister. In the early 50s, Bakhtiar had been a junior minister in Mohammad Mossadegh's government. When he became prime minister in 1951, Mossadegh had tried and failed to curb the Shah's power. Bakhtiar's first act was to dissolve Savak and arrest a number of former ministers. Bakhtiar, good morning. Could you say a few words for English television? Government, please. Who would be the, the punishment of the person who was in charge for torture, for bribery, and so and so? It's generally agreed that the government of Dr. Bakhtiar has only a slim chance of success, and that that depends to a great extent on whether or not the Shah will go. But the question of that still clearly far from being resolved. The position of Iran's fourth prime minister in five months can at best be described as precarious. The Shah's new prime minister had no confidence in his king. One of Bakhtiar's conditions for accepting the premiership was that the Shah should leave the country. As the Shah's power ebbed away, the American government was split on the best way forward. They saw the Shah as a useful ally in the battle to counter Soviet influence in the region. Under President Nixon, he'd been encouraged to build up his military and become America's gendarme in the Persian Gulf. Despite initial reservations, President Carter had continued the policy. Now, Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, a staunch anti-communist of Polish origin, wanted to encourage the Shah to crush the demonstrations and shore up his position once and for all. But Carter's Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance, was in favor of talking to the Ayatollah and his revolutionaries. In early January, the leaders of the US, France, Britain, and Germany discussed the crisis at an informal conference in Guadeloupe. According to the New York Times, they agreed that although a new government in Iran may create difficulties for the Americans, it will be essentially pro-Western and not communist-oriented. In effect, they had given up on the Shah and were encouraged rather than alarmed by what they were hearing from Paris. In Iran, there is no talk of communism. And even if there are communists, they're in a minority. In Iran, there is no danger of communists jeopardizing the interests of others. We want neither the communists nor any other foreigners, whatever power they have, to interfere in the affairs of Iran. We want to achieve our own liberty and independence. On his return from the conference, the French president, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, brought a message from President Carter for Ayatollah Khomeini. محتوای متن این بودش که به زودی شاه ایران ترک میکنه. دولت امریکا میخواد که آقای خمینی از دولت بختیار حمایت بکنه. سومی که اگر چنانچه آقای خمینی از دولت بختیار حمایت نکنه، بختیار سقوط بکنه، نظامیان کودتا میکنن. خب محتوا تقریبا این بود. آقای خمینی هم جواب داد که اولا بختیار کاری نیست، بختیار قانونی نیستش دو اینکه نظامیان اختیارش دست امریکایی هاست اگر چنانچه نظامی ها بخوان کویتا بکنن مردم میدانند که امریکایی ها دارن این کار میکنن و مردم مقاومت میکنن منم حکم جهاد خواهم داد از این حرفا و دولت امریکا مسئول خواهد بود توصیه کرده بودن که امریکا دست از حمایت بختیار برداره بذاره خود مردم ماها عرض کنم که اوزار رو بهتر می توانیم آرام بکنیم تا شما ها On January the 16th the Shah accepted the inevitable and announced that he was leaving Iran for a holiday On January the 16th the Shah accepted the inevitable and announced that he was leaving Iran for a holiday خیلی وحشتناک بود ببینید موقعی که آدم به خصوص برای علازت من نمیتونم خودم رو جای علازت بذارم یه مردی که تمام عمر و زندگیش رو در راه مملکت گذاشته که با اون حالت بخواد بره و آدم ببینید سرزمینش خاکی اون جایی که دنیا آمده تمام 
دوستانش رو هر چیزی که بهش علاقه داره بذاره بره و ندونه که آیا یه بازگشتی هست یا نه طبیعتا ادهی که در کاخ بودن اون روز با گریه و زاریه میگفتن نرین و یه ده دیگه هم بودن که قبلا در جلسات می آمدن می گفتن ولی خب غیر از این که ما بهشون بگیم که امیدتون رو نگردارین و اینجوری نمی مونه ما بر می گردیم خیلی مشکل بود به خصوص اون موقعی که اصلا حاک ایران رو ترک می کردیم که آدم فکر نمی کرد که بر نمی گرده همشه یه امیدی بود واقعا امید داشته نمی دونه آدم فکر نمی کرد که اینجوری می مونه نمی دونم شایدم نه ولی فکر هم نمی کردم سی سال طول بگیر While the Queen had hope the Shah seemed less convinced that they would return He took the remains of his father's body with him This couple were among the few Iranians who mourned the Shah's departure Millions more celebrated The light of the Aryans was stripped of all his titles. Newspaper headlines announced his departure with just two words, Shah Raft, the Shah is gone. The desk of the Empress Farah is still adorned with pictures of her family, although a palace aide said that one of the things she had taken with her was a collection of photograph albums. Quite clearly, none of the priceless pictures and mementos collected by the Pahlavi dynasty over the years have been taken away, and the staff and the guards are convinced that they're just keeping the house warm for their master's return. <laughs> In Paris, Ayatollah Khomeini prepared for his return. His stay in France had been funded by Iran's merchants, the men who bought and sold goods in the bazaars around the country. They also financed most of his supporters' activities. Now, they paid for his flight to Iran. بازار داشته بازاری ها وجوهات می دادن روحانیت ایران قبل از انقلاب از این وجوهات زندگی می کرد بنابراین روابط بسیار تنگ و تنگی داشتن همین روحانی هم بودن که دلار فرستادن پاریس که ما هواپیمای ایر فرانس رو چارتر کردیم اومدیم به ایران ما که پول نداشتیم Inside Iran, Hashem Sabahian had the task of preparing the country for the Ayatollah's return He started by negotiating with the army and with Iran's national airline. The Saudi Arabia and Iran's یه تیم ساری رو فرستادن با اونم من چندین بار مذاکره داشتم اونا گفتن ما هواپیما رو سلامت میشونیم اولا قرار بود هواپیما از اینجا جمهوری اسلامی بره اونجا اونا اونجا صحبت کردن دولت فرانسه گفته بود نه ما خودمون ایر فرانس رو میفرسیم و اینها اومد While the negotiations continued the country waited The army added to the already surreal atmosphere by fighting an imaginary enemy in training maneuvers mounted for the world's press. The army remains unswervingly loyal to the Shah, and according to the commanders, they'll support the government of Dr. Bakhtiar with resolution, patriotism, and discipline. By going to Iran himself, the Ayatollah is playing his trump card. It'll unite his angry followers there even more, and he believes it'll help them simply sweep away the fragile government of Dr. Bakhtiar, whom he's refused to meet or to recognize. And he called today on the Iranian army to refuse to obey its orders. We France charter France and we have to get the gas to the gas to get the gas to the gas to the gas to the gas. The big gas was a big gas. 
از همین ایرانیایی که بودن همه همراه آمدن یه حدود 100 نفر ما خبرنگارا با ما بودن که خب اینا مایل بودن خودشون با ما بیان ما استقبال کردیم البته بعدا من ایراد گرفتن گفتن شما خبرنگارا رو غیر اخلاقی عمل کردید برای اینکه گفتید خبرنگارا بیان اونجا بشن زامن برای اینکه مال نزنن خب ما که نگفته بودیم شما بیاید خودشون داوطلب شدن ما هم استقبال کردیم ولی پشت ذهنمون هم بود که خوبه چرا استقبال کردیم مجانی برایشون داریم بیاریم ایران عاشق چشم ابرشون که نبودیم که گفته بودیم یک اونا میخوان با ما همراه باشن ما میخوایم یه سیف چیزی داشته باشه تضمینی باشه خب وقتی که اونا تو هواپی ما بودن هواپی ما رو نمیزدن چون خبرهای زیادی ما داشتیم که ممکنه هواپی ما رو در بالای فضا ایران بزنن من با پلیس هم صحبت کردم قرار بر این شد گذرنامه ها رو یه افراد نیان گذرنامه ها رو من بیارم بدم به پلیس پلیس همه رو مهر مهر ورود بزنه After his 15 years in exile, rejecting every effort at compromise, the Ayatollah has planned his return with masterly timing. He's come back to a country which has been without effective government for months, and he intends to provide the effective government himself. Its main inspiration would be religious. One man can command such adoration. How so many people can believe that this frail old priest holds all the answers to Iran's problems. Yet, this, they say, is evidence enough that he does. Ayatollah Khomeini delivered his first speech on home soil in Tehran's largest cemetery. من دهن این دولت میدنم من دولت تعیین میکنم من به فشتبانی این ملت دولت تعیین میکنم من به واسطه این ملت مرا قبل میدارم Just days later, while Bakhtiar was still in power, a group of Air Force officers saluted Ayatollah Khomeini as their new commander-in-chief. The Ayatollah then named his own Prime Minister, Mehdi Bazargan, to head a new government. Like the Shah before him, Bakhtiar turned to the Israeli intelligence service, Mossad, for advice. In the past few years, they came to us all the way to Mossad, and they asked us to do something with Khomeini, to do something with him today. וברור למה הם התכוונו. ואנחנו חשבנו שעם כל הכבוד, אנחנו לא שוטרים של העולם. ואם יש לאיראנים בעיה, שיטפלו בה בעצמם. ארבעה ימים לפני המהפכה הלכתי ופגשתי את ראש הממשלה האחרון, שפור בכתיאר, בעניינים שהוא ביקש לשוחח איתי. בין השאר, שוחחתי איתו על המצב ואמרתי לו שאני... ממונה על תוכנית החירום של הישראלים ואיך הוא רואה את המצב. הוא היה כמו דון קישוט, חזק, אל תדאגו, הכל יהיה בסדר, אם רק הייתם יכולים לעשות משהו עם חומייני. On the morning of the 11th of February 1979, Bakhtiar waited for a planned meeting with his army commanders. They never showed up. Shortly after 12 noon, the army announced its neutrality in the battle between the Shah and the people. Then, in a final bout of street fighting, the old regime was swept away. Two and a half thousand years of Persian monarchy had come to an end, and overnight, Khomeini's revolutionaries took charge of the ministries, the army, and the media. In the mayhem that followed, anyone associated with the old regime was at risk. Dariush Homayun was lucky. In a final bout of street fighting, the old regime was swept away. Two and a half thousand years of Persian monarchy had come to an end, and overnight, Khomeini's revolutionaries took charge of the ministries, the army, 
and the media. In the mayhem that followed, anyone associated with the old regime was at risk. Darius Homayoun was lucky and was among a handful of former officials who managed to escape from prison. تو در اون مدت که ما اونجا بودیم اون هفته های آخر 600 تا سربازی از پادگان رفتن فرار کردن ولی در مدت تیراندازی بله ما در سلول ها بودیم نشسته بودیم و گوش به زنگ چه خبر بشه این سرباز های نگهبان ما اونهایی که مانده بودن گاهی می آمدن سراغ ما و قبر می دادن بعد خلاصه یکشون آمد و گفتش که اینهایی که به زندان هم بکرد به دجوان هم کردن میگویند که زندانی ها آزادند و بران دجوان 600 زندانی نظامی بودند دیگه و پامانفر و افسر و سرباز و اینا اونجا بودند و ما, ما هم رفتیم پایین دیگه همه توی هم بودیم و توانستیم بعد از در موج دوم فرار خلاصه ما هم فرار کردیم ما هم بیرون رفتیم Many of the Shah's former ministers who were imprisoned on his orders were summarily executed. Among them, Abbas Hoveyda, the former prime minister. The United States was one of the first countries to recognize the new Islamic government. The Shah was now extremely ill. Obviously, my heart is bleeding. This is my whole life. For 37 years, I have toiled and sweat, and I had tears, and to make my country what it was and what it could have been, and look at what it is now. The Shah died in Egypt on the 27th of July 1980 at the age of 60. The former queen, Farah, lives in exile between France and the United States. Ibrahim Yazdi and Hashim Sabahian joined the new provisional government in Iran. Yazdi became the foreign minister, Sabahian the minister of interior. In November 1979, Abbas Abdi joined a group of students who stormed and took over the American embassy in Tehran. The provisional government ordered the students out, but Ayatollah Khomeini gave them his backing. Within weeks, he'd appointed a new, more radical government. Yazdi and Sabahian are now both members of the opposition to the current government of Iran. After the death of the Ayatollah in 1989, Abbas Abdi too became a reformist and has been jailed twice for criticizing the regime. Watching a revolution is like watching a hurricane. It's beautiful, powerful. You don't know what it's going to do. You could have a rainbow at the end of the hurricane or you could have a flood. You don't know. Michael Matrinko and 51 other Americans became hostages for 444 days. The United States cut its diplomatic ties with Iran. It had been blindsided by the speed of events there, but it's unlikely it could have prevented the revolution. Hostility between the two countries is still a reality today, with implications beyond the Middle East.